today we will discuss on the topic of ahilya from the ramayan so ahilya cursed and blessed and the overall theme is shrinking and expanding of consciousness now in the ramayan there are various stories which interview with the main story of the ramayan at various levels the main story is ram sir is ramayan literally means the ayan is journey so ram the journey of ram that's the main story now while this journey is going along ram has many adventures also so one of the adventures in the forest is his interaction with <clears throat> is his interaction by which ahilya is released from a curse so let's look at that story today i'll discuss broadly four points uh, ahilya story will discuss then i'll talk about feminist misreadings of the epics then i'll talk about the men- potency of the lord lotus feet and then we'll talk about how our consciousness can be expanded and not shrunk what shrinks our consciousness and what expands our consciousness that's the overall topic of our discussion today so the last part will be the thrust but there will be many other points we'll discuss along the way so now ahalya many aspects of the ramayana have been uh, narrated in different ways and <clears throat> a few maybe a few years ago somebody had sent me a u- video apparently it's there on youtube there's the ahalya story has been rendered in a different way by some uh by some modern filmmaker or whatever where the basic storyline is that there is this attractive looking woman and whoever gets attracted to her she is married to someone else but whoever gets attracted to her that person gets turned into a stone because it is that person's attraction it is that person's wrong desire which is the problem so the the underlying subtext is that actually ahalya was a victim and it was she was punished although she was a victim but actually the one who should be punished is the opposite so let's look at basically the story ahalya is a chaste wife of a great sage and she is a, a she is a yogini her husband is a yogi and she is a yogini and while they are living together in the forest at that time her husband goes for a bath and when he when he is gone suddenly he returns and he wants to be with her so she is a little surprised but what has actually happened is that it is indra who has impersonated as her husband and has come because she is so attractive and he wants to be with her and then um indra unites with her and then while he is leaving at that time her husband comes back and when he sees what has happened he gets enraged and he curses both indra and ahilya and indra is cursed to indra is said to have indra is a very powerful being so he is cursed in a, to become deformed now he is deformed in a particular way that his whole body becomes covered with a thousand reproductive organs this is as a female reproductive organs so you are so you are so captivated by that let that fill your body so indra becomes mortified embarrassed and he says please forgive me please forgive me and finally his uh, it changes to his changes to a uh, thousand eyes so so sahastra yoni sahasraksha that's the word that is used sometimes it's sometimes used for the supreme lord and is also used for the it's used for the virat rupa sometimes it's used also for indra and then he turns towards ahalya and he curses ahalya says you become a stone now ahalya begs falls at his feet and falls at begs forgiveness but still he curses her so this seems to be there are several aspects over here now why why does he get cursed like this so this is the indra and it is because of indra's cunningness that he is able to exploit ahalya so indra is cursed 
and nahalya is also curse so the common story line is that ahalya is a victim one is that there was one man's lust and another man's anger and in between she gets victimized well yeah it seems like that but the story is told in various places in the ramayana itself there is a clear mention of some significant detail that is overlooked and then beyond that there is there are details which are told in other puranas also so what is one very significant detail that is say was a halya victim not exactly ahalya was it is a it is a quick conclusion it's an easy conclusion to come to but it is we can't be so fast ahalya was also yogini and she recognized it is indra who had impersonated as her husband and yet when she saw her coming saw him coming she felt gratified delighted that the king of the gods had gone so far gone through such lengths to be with her and then she succumbed to that that thrill that she got over there so it was now we could say indra was decidedly devious he was wicked and because uh, he made a whole cunning plan to do something terrible, uh, terrible. but in contrast ahalya had a moment of weakness so she didn't go about scheming the way indra did but she did also had a moment of weakness it was not that she was completely faultless or completely ignorant she knew what was happening but somehow she succumbed at that time and this brings us to uh, significant differences a significant difference between say male and female psychology mm, that is you no know, lust allures different people differently within lust allures men with pleasure and pleasure means men desire women the desire for having a woman for uh, enjoying with a woman that is the basically the physical form of a woman that's what a man is attracted to in contrast what a woman women also lust is not women not free from lust but how lust attracts more or less captivates women is that women desire the desire of men hmm? so so desire if i can just remove for from both it might become women desire men desire women and women desire the desire of men now what this means is that i put over here also that there is the men are allured by pleasure through lust and women are allured through power allured through power means that it it is a, it is a heady sense of of, uh, of power uh for a woman to see that okay i'm able to attract attract so many men or attract such a powerful man if somebody enters into a room and everybody stops doing whatever they are doing and looks at that person it 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 is a it is a titillating sensation and especially when a woman is young and attractive and every young woman is by nature given some attractiveness and some women are of course much more attractive than others and that is that has its power so everybody has to deal with lust in their own ways and say uh men are you know you have to regulate uh, the desire for men and women have to regulate the desire for the desire of men that means women are told that especially after marriage don't dress very attractively to parade to the whole world and dress in a chaste way so why is that because na that is the way in which say desire manifests the male and female psychology are different and for a woman this the desire for the desire of man is the way lust allures in fact uh, there are many significant ways in which um, this is this plays out in in the modern world also even if we call it the post modern world the post modern today's world has placed us in has placed many challenges before us now sometimes this is not a very pal palatable subject to talk about but it's it's in some ways relevant to our topic so that you know porn is a big problem in today's world and in some ways this problem illustrates how our technology has become too strong for our morality our technology has become too strong for our morality 
because uh, the temptation is available just by clicking a few buttons and uh, no in today's world you know, people can see more obscenity in 5 minutes than what maybe 50 years ago even 50 years ago people could have seen in entire lifetime so the temptation available is overwhelming so if we consider our morality like our weight lifting capacity and tech, the te- technology temptations coming from technology are like a heavy weight so what has happened is that technology has grown too fast for our morality to keep pace and millions of people uh, fall prey to this and there may be very good people who fall prey to it also in the sense that normally uh, behave in very responsible respectable ways according to some surveys around 78% of people in the world succumb to this it's difficult to first of all to define what is porn secondly decide what is at what level is one considered to be like a regular user or addict and but the point i'm making is slightly different i'm not going to go into porn i'm going to talk here about how men and women the psychology works differently so usually porn is thought of as a male problem but there is another kind of uh, another kind of genre which attracts women which is now been called as pormans pormans novels is like romant romance novels which have a lot of obscene content in them and these have a huge sales in fact one of the most prominent one of the best selling authors in this pormans genre when she published her first novel for one and a half years she got it was only an ebook and for one and a half years every month she was earning 400000 dollars per month in royalty so millions of literally millions and millions of books are sold and the consumers of these kind of books are primarily women so men are attracted more visually so that's why porn is visual but women are attracted more verbally to words and description words and if you look at these novels i mean you don't have to look at them but the point is that i read some articles about them and they are about quite a bit about sexual aggressiveness it features men who are quite aggressive so now what happens is it's people find it titillating women find it titillating why because this is you know as i said women desire the desire of men so if a man is so aggressive in his desire for uh, for a woman not aggressive in the sense of being abusive or violent but aggressive within the context of affection then that captivates so you know, the, the the detail that is overlooked in the many detailings of the of the ramayana of this ahalya story that last allures different people that ahalya knew that did de- ahalya knew that it was indra that is a significant detail it's not just a it's not just passing information so there are people mm, who are there are actually psychologists who treat is that there are uh, there are people who there is porn addiction is a recognized form of addiction and people there are ways to treat that but the psychologists are saying that uh, we need to also have something like a pormans addiction that now what happens is if somebody is looking at visual obscenity it seems obscene clearly but if somebody is just reading a romance novel now of course the romance novel is a very big genre and sometimes there are books which may be just about just a romantic story without much sexuality in it but they are the exception not the norm so people get hooked onto these books and then there by people i mean primarily women again and their mind become filled with all kinds of fantasies and uh, it has consequences also so the idea is that rather than thinking of lust as a as a say a, as a problem among males who are victimizing women rather we need to see that lust is a common problem that males and women females both face that's what krishna says uh iha vairinam kamesha krodesha rajoguna samudbhava mahashano mahapapma vidye enam yah vairinam that is the enemy of humanity iha refers to everyone in this world mahashano mahapapma it's the all devouring sinful enemy of the whole world and if you look at the mahabharat at one level ravan is the embodiment of lust that's true but if you look at the whole story what inflames it is or what triggers the story 
is not just Ravana's lust for Sita. It is also Shurpankha's lust for Ram. And because she's scorned, because she's rejected, so then she manipulates and schemes. And he says, okay, Sita came in my way. I will destroy Sita. And how will I destroy Sita? By having her abducted by taken. If, if I can't enjoy, if I can't enjoy Ram, then no one will be able to enjoy Ram. Even Sita should not be able to enjoy Ram. So what will happen? She ha it is she who instigates Ravan to abduct Sita. Now, of course, we can't say that Ravan is innocent. No, Ravan is, of course, definitely has, um, he is the embodiment of lust, as I mentioned. But in this particular narrative, Ravana's lust is triggered by Sita. Initially, when Ravan hears about how, about what has happened, uh, he's angry. But when he hears it's Sita, sorry, it's Ram, he actually he decides not to do anything. Because he's heard from his military generals, from Maricha specifically, that it's, it's a complicated storyline. Uh, and I won't go into detail again, but suffice it to say that, see, first, Shur, the Shur, events are that Shurpanka tries to allure Ram and Ram refuses. And then she tries to attack Sita. And then she's punished for that. Then she goes to her brother's current Dushan and they attack Ram. And Ram kills all of them single-handedly. And then one general, Akampan, survives. His name is Akampan, but he's doing all Kampan. He's trembling and he runs away and tells Ravan what has happened. And at that time, Akampan gives the idea don't, to Ravan, don't attack Ram directly. It seems that Ram must be very attached to his wife. That's why he's brought his wife to the forest. Now, demons can't, can only think in terms of the negatives. They can't think in terms of commitment and service. Ram must be wanting to enjoy Sita. That's why he wants her to be with him. And that's why he's brought her to the forest. So, but he can't think in terms of that Sita is committed. Sita wants to be with Ram. She has a sense of commitment and duty. So I'll talk a little later about how feminist uh, re re readings of the Ram epics can be distorted. But this idea that oh, Ram... Ram brought Sita because he's attached to her. That means as if Sita has no sense of agency or intelligence or free will, Ram has dragged her to the forest against her will. He says, if you take Sita away from him, then what will happen? He will become weak. Because he's so attached to her, if he loses the object of attachment, he will become weak. And once he becomes weak, then you can attack and kill him. And Ravan says, good idea. Now, at this point, he has not really heard about Sita. Now, there are some retellings of the Ramayana which do say that uh, Ravan was uh, present at the Swayamvar of Sita, but that is not told in the Valmiki Ramayana. And at this point, Ravan gives no indication that he knows Sita specifically, or he especially knows about uh, Sita's overwhelming beauty. So he says, okay, for him at this stage, Sita is simply a pawn in his power game with Ram. Then he thinks, okay, if I have to abduct Sita, he goes to Maricha. And he asks Maricha for help. He says, you, you change your form. And whom do you want to, what do you want to do? He says, I want to abduct Ram's wife. Maricha gets alarmed. He says, so what enemy of yours told you this? Never do this. Ram is so powerful, he will destroy all of us. And he just goes on and on speaking. And on hearing this, Ravan becomes circumspect. Okay, he knows Maricha is also a powerful demon. And if Maricha is strongly warning, maybe there's something to it. And he becomes deterred and he goes back. So for him at this point, it's, okay, it's a military conquest, but no. Uh, but if there's too much risk in it, better not do it. Mm. But then Shurpankha comes and Shurpankha tries to agitate him. And, you know, just see how your sister has been disgraced. So he says, no. He says that, tell us me what happened. And he tells everything. He says, no, it was your mistake. They were living peacefully. Why did you go and mess with them? When it is your mistake, how can I go and attack them when you started it all? Now, Ravan is trying to save face. And in front of his, in his courtier, in his court, in front of his courtiers and citizens, because Shurpanka has confronted him there. So then Shurpanka says, 
But you know why I went there? I went there because I wanted to get Sita for you and she was so beautiful. And then she starts going about describing Sita's beauty. And that's when Ravana's lust gets inside her. So again, the point I'm making over here is that it was Shurpanakha who used Sita as a pawn in her power game to get back at Ram. So that was also her lust. And the, the Gita says that lust when frustrated it leads to anger. Kamesha, Krodesha. So lust is present in everyone and we need to, human beings need to see lust as a common enemy for all of humanity. Not that this is an enemy for, um, that it is men who are victimizing women. So uh, now, of course, in terms of relative, uh, relative culpability, it was Indra who did, who did a greater crime and Indra had to be punished severely. And Indra got a curse by which he was deformed severely. And Ahalya got a curse by which she was turned into a stone. So I'll talk about the stone uh, in a few minutes when we come to that part, what, what that uh, turning into a stone signifies. But basically, the idea was that Ahalya had a moment of weakness. And it was that moment of weakness which led to her getting a consequence of that. As I mentioned, as a, why was Ahalya cursed? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Because it is not because Indra fooled her, because she let herself be knowingly fooled by Indra. So now I'll move to the second part that about the feminist readings of the epics. So as I said, from the feminist perspective, Ahalya is a classic example of, of how powerless women were in the past and how they were victimized uh, by, by powerful or abusive, exploitative men, something like that. So, actually, so one of the, somehow the Ramayana has been uh, the subject of many feminist readings and in the Mahabharata also to some extent. And uh, now when I talk about feminism, feminism itself has many different meanings. And at one level, feminism began, again, I don't want to go much into the history, but quickly, why I'm using the word feminism in what context? It started with the First World War and the Second World War where especially in America and Europe, all the men went to fight. And at that time, there was nobody to do many of the other duties in society. And uh, women came forward and many professions, which it was thought that women will not be able to do, they started doing it. So that's how, uh, that's how it was discovered that women can do many things which were traditionally thought only men can do. But then men came back uh, after the war ended and the men came back and then women said, yeah, we can do all this. We want to continue doing this. So at one level, if we consider that if people, if any, any person from any gender has a particular inspiration to do certain things and so has the ability to do it well, then why stop them from doing it? Mm -hmm. So that at one level, if there is exploitation, where there is restriction, there's artificial, unnecessary, counterproductive restriction. Stopping that was one level of feminism. And that is, that is fine as far as it goes. However, gender, things have gone much further. Now, feminists have often have started reinterpreting all of human history. It's not that we women should get equal opportunities, but that women have been exploited throughout history by men. And now, it is the time to turn things around. Turn things around means that wherever men try to assert their masculinity, a common phrase in today's intellectual parlance is toxic masculinity. That wherever men try to become any assertive, that assertiveness is toxic. And that's what is causing, causing all kinds of problems in society. So it is, uh, it is not just here now, Feminism is no longer about equal rights for men and women. It has become to some extent about, uh, about minimizing and uh, even demonizing men. Now, again, when there are intellectual trends in society, it is not that most people even know about those trends, what to speak of, subscribe for them. But these trends eventually permeate into society. So the writings of prominent feminist authors are in that genre 
and they are having a trickle down effect in society at a gradual at a at a broader level so now <clears throat> so as i said there are different levels of feminism so first level was that women should not be deprived of opportunities just because of being women that is one level and that was circumstantially fair enough then second was women should have all the opportunities that men have well this level itself becomes a little problematic because women and men are different they are physically different they are psychologically different the question is not whether women can do everything that men men can do the question is is it worth it is it worth it in the sense that women have been given by nature a special power a super power that is the power of having of continuing humanity of having children so do we neglect that and uh, go towards something else so psychologist carl jung the prominent psychologist and he phrased the difference between men and women quite articulately he said men seek perfection women seek wholeness what he meant by that was men seek perfection now again this is not universal because there are always exceptions and uh, but this is a overall tendency what he said is that men often seek perfection means they want to do one thing and they want to be perfect in doing that thing so there are men who become obsessive about their careers but women seek wholeness means that they want various aspects in their life they want family they want children they want relationships and they want career so there can be one of the reasons why one the reason they say that is uh, there is gender discrimination today is that many of the top ceos are men and not women and uh, that is true but is it because of gender discrimination not necessarily because you need to rise to the top in any area any field one has to literally work obsessively and uh, men there are some men who want to work that obsessively but more often than not women realize i don't want to i don't want to work like this i want to have a life for some people their career is entirely their life but for most women it is not like that and uh, there are various other reasons you know, women usually if they want to ha- have a family have a child they have to do it by the age of 35 40 at the most you know men can postpone that and they can have a child even at the age of 60 or 70 so what happens is men can neglect a family for long and they can per- continue with their careers obsessively that's not healthy for men also but men can do that so women don't feel driven to do that way they may be driven by the sus- pressure of society that i also want to achieve i also want to have a big career but over a period of time they feel it's not worth it you know working 50 60 hours a week or 70 80 hours a week Uh, what uh, more than that also at times what what is the point of it um, what is the point of it I, i i want to have a life so so that level 2 was itself somewhat problematic but level 3 3 became even more problematic that as i said it was a revisioning or reenvisioning of all of history as women have been put down by men and therefore now women have a right to put men down so the the result of this th- third level feminism is that as i said that if you see all of history as or oh, women have been exploited by men then the epics the epics are books which have in india the epics and in other religions also there are other cultures also there are their founding literature so all of them have been reread that way so even many classic books say in the west there is shakespeare there's wordsworth there's charles dickens and there are feminist readings of all of these where they try to show how actually they are all biased against women now, uh, so that has happened with in india also so the what happens with respect to feminist readings they say that women are simply seen as victims not as conscious agents with character and commitment so the strength of women is seen in a different way in scripture than the strength of men in the epics and that has been going on throughout history not just within religious history or religious texts <coughs> but um, today it is ex- expected that a woman is successful only when she has a career the way the man has so it's it's a little strange that feminism claims that this that women's rights will be asserted when basically when women become 
better equal or better copycats of men than men now is that what is required so one of the one of the biggest controversial aspects of the ramayana is the exiling of sita and that is seen as the classic example of how uh, our how a woman was exploited and abandoned and rejected for no fault of hers now there are many different explanations given for this one is of course is ram was concerned about his reputation and for his reputation he abandoned sita well okay that is one reading but what was the reputation over there that has to be understood now there are many other interpretations there is another interpretation is that again a feminist reading is that the dashrath was attached to kaikai and because of that attachment to kaikai he did something terrible he had ram exiled to the forest so when ram and sita united came back they came they united after uh, after the killing of ravan and they were in they were in ayodhya so then ram and sita were very happy together in the kingdom and at that time ram feared that i will become attached to sita the way dashrath became attached to kaikai and then i will do something wrong because of that attachment and that's why he was looking for an excuse to free himself from sita and when this accusation came up that he just used that accusation as a, as a pretext now this is such a ridiculous reading that now ram never considered dashrath to be attached to kaikai but that was the accusation that lakshman made that dashrath is so attached to kaikai that's why he is doing this and ram said no he is not doing this out of infatuation he is doing this out of obligation he has given his word to kaikai and he cannot take it back so ascribing this motive to ram is is a completely distorted and perverted reading of the ramayana now as i said sita's strength of character is seen even in her exile i have written a whole article on the exile of sita and it's in my book wisdom from ramayana and i have a whole class on it but i'll focus on this theme that women in scriptures are not victims they are also conscious agents they have character they have commitment and the best way to understand why ram sent sita away is to see that as an act of sacrifice and you can compare that act of sacrifice to another act of sacrifice when dashrath sent ram away to the forest and then ram sent sita away to the forest both are acts of both are acts of sacrifice and dashrath didn't victimize ram dashrath was not getting any perverse pleasure in sending ram away dashrath was driven by his duty by his position and by his word he was forced against his will to send sita, send uh, ram away similarly ram didn't victimize sita ram got no joy in sending sita away if that had been ram's reason, if ram simply wanted to get rid of sita and he could have got rid of her and he could have married somebody else he didn't do that even after he sent sita away he still considered sita to be so respectable that he had a uh, effigy of sita made a golden effigy which would sit next to him during the fire sacrifices that he was supposed to perform as a king so ram just as dashrath didn't consider ram to have committed any wrong in any way similarly ram didn't consider sita to have committed any wrong in any way if he had considered sita to be impure why would he keep such an impure woman's effigy in uh, in the fire sacrifice and why would the brahmins allow such a impure woman's effigy to be kept so it is an act of sacrifice now both when dashrath sent ram away that that caused pain to ram that caused pain to dashrath also it was not that dashrath was a power hungry man who was who was exploiting ram no both of them were with, they had to sacrifice for the higher cause because that's what duty called them similarly ram and sita they sacrificed for a higher cause when they got separated now just ram this is ram's exile was an act of sacrifice similarly sita's exile is an act of sacrifice for a higher duty now the specifics of the duty may be difficult for us to understand in today's world we may say that you know okay even dashrath had given some word to kaikai no is he ex- is he does he have to keep that word to such an extent that he has to send his son away uh, for no fault even dashrath's action may not make sense to us and similarly ram's action may not make sense to us but the point is 
the whole ramayana is permeated with the spirit of sacrifice that for the sake of duty for the sake of higher cause sacrifice so ram sacrifice for dashrath sake then lakshman sacrifices for ram sake that lakshman goes with ram and lakshman's wife wants to come with him and ram says no so lakshman says no i want to be serving ram and then bharat sacrifices for ram sake how is that bharat doesn't enjoy any royal opulence bharat lives in a small cottage except voluntarily accepting terms of exile similar to rams he takes on the responsibility of the kingdom without taking any of the privileges of the kingdom so bharat sacrifices so will sita sacrifices when she goes with ram to the forest so that same act of sacrifice which is running throughout the ramayana it sees its culmination in sita's going away so both ram and sita sacrifice at that time so it is not a rejection of sita by ram rather it is a situation that forces them to get separated and they sacrifice for that purpose both of them sacrifice so the point here is sita sita is going away is or sita is being sent away it is not sita is simply a victim of ram's uh, ram's obsession with his reputation or something like that sita also understands she she is heartbroken to be separated from ram but she understands she i know why he has done it my heart can't accept it but i know why he has done it and the test that sita doesn't have this victim mentality is oh life is so unfair to me is that one proof the many we could have is that sita never poisons her son's minds about ram she doesn't tell anyone about who she tell them who her she actually uh, she doesn't really tell them who her father is but normally if say if two if there is a couple that gets separated and then there are custody battles for the children and usually what happens is each spouse you know poisons the children's mind against the other spouse while the children are here hello oh, the mother will say your father is so bad he did this this and the father will say your mother is so bad so if sita had that feeling of being a victim sita would have spouted it out to rao and kush but she never did that so the point is that to think of uh, sita's exile or to read the epics in terms of this feminist lens where women are victims that is that is a it is a completely distorted reading mm. now are women victims in the epics no women can also be victimizers as i said which i talked about shurpankha already that shurpankha was a victimizer uh, she she was victimized in the sense that her nose was cut off but she it was she who started it she attacked sita first she coveted ram and then she manipulated ravan also so there are just as men can be in different roles women can also be in different roles now draupadi is seen as a victim in the mahabharat that she was uh, say so she was forced to marry five men and she had to go to the forest because of the people whom she married but you know there are there is the multiple facets to the story one reason the whole story gets provoked duryodhan gets provoked is because draupadi laughs at him when duryodhan slips and falls in the kuru in the in the maya sabha at that time draupadi laughs at him and that enrages duryodhan now why exactly draupadi laughed there's a whole uh, there's a whole discussion which you can go into on my youtube channel there's a whole class on why draupadi laughs why krishna allows him to laugh but the point is when draupadi was dishonored in the kuru assembly or at least the attempt was made everybody was silent but draupadi argued strongly trying to remind everyone of dharma and be even bhishma lauded her so, so draupadi is not like a weak female when some small problem comes up you no know, she just fades or she just becomes hysterical draupadi remembers dharma and reminds everyone of dharma so actually if we look at the whole vastraharan story the character who comes out best or the character who who comes out strongest through it is draupadi you know she reveals how she might be a woman but she has a spine of steel over there she is dishonored but she comes out as the most honorable in that character in, in that in that particular incident so and when she was dishonored it was her husband restored her honor eventually by punishing those who had offended her those who had tried to dishonor her 
So the point is that our women victims, now there are multiple facets to each character. And life is such that sometimes we make mistakes and others exploit us. Sometimes others make mistakes and we may exploit them. So sometimes we do intentionally, sometimes we don't do intentionally. To see, to see everything from one perspective is, is like, what is that saying? It's the saying is that if you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Everything looks like a nail. So now that's how if, if somebody is too obsessed with their one particular ideology, say feminism, then they see everything uh, from that perspective. But the epics are multi-level. There are a lot of depth and a lot of complexity in them. So why are we discussing all this? We're discussing this primarily to, to highlight this point that to call Ahalya as a victim is superficial. So where women and victims, these are two incidents, Draupadi and Ram. Um, so now if you look at human history, also feminism holds that, oh, men exploited women throughout human history. That's a very superficial reading of history. It's a distorted reading. Because throughout history, life was tough. Life was tough. That And man and woman both struggled to make a life. Now when we're talking about history, we're not talking about Satyuga. Because say modern feminist readings, they don't even know about Satyuga. We're talking about history as is known by modern historical methods. That it goes to a few thousand years or more beyond that. So life was not comfortable. You know, people had to struggle against nature. People had to struggle against uh, uh, shortages of various kind. And they struggled to make a life and have a family amidst the world, which has amidst the world's many challenges. And uh, it was, men had difficult jobs too. It was that... You know, men had to fight wars, men had to hunt and they were hunted. Men worked underground in mines, men... Life was tough for everyone. And most of the ugly, dirty, uh, horrible jobs were done by men. It was not that, say, women were at home and they were restricted at home by men and men were going out lording it over. No, everybody had it tough. And men, nobody had the energy to exploit anyone else because life itself was so tough. And men couldn't afford to exploit women because women were vital life partners for them, for maintain, for taking care of the family. This, there is definitely division of gender roles. And from today's perspective, that division of gender roles might seem unfair. And that's a, something which can be discussed separately. But the point is that uh, that gender division has sustained humanity for, for centuries, for millennia. And whether that, that same gender division exactly has to be continued in today's society is open to discussion. But to consider that that gender division was simply because men were out to exploit women. No, it was a functional requirement in society. And society worked that way. So, now was there exploitation? Of course there was exploitation. But it was, there was a few powerful men who exploited the rest of humanity, both men and women. Uh, usually these few powerful men were kings, they were tyrants, they were rulers. And uh, if there was one tyrannical king who wanted to who wanted to expand his kingdom, then we often talk about Alexander the Great. Now, what was great? He, he conquered so many kingdoms. But in one sense, what was he doing? He pushed his soldiers literally to death. Now, he, when he would travel, he would travel in comfort. He had a chariot, he had a horse, he had an elephant, whatever. He would travel really, really to comfort. And his soldiers had to trudge along, not only walking across long distances, but carrying, carrying heavy weapons, carrying um, the stuff required for their tents and everything. And he, he wanted to conquer more and more lands. And the soldiers said, no, we will not do it. And finally, he turned away from India for various reasons. One was that his soldiers just rebelled against him. And they rebelled because you know, they just found it too much. So yes, now he was not a particularly oppressive king, but kings had power and they exploited who was within them, who was under their power. So exploitation was there, but it was those who had power were exploiting those who were powerless. So not men exploiting women. It is, it is the kings or the tyrants or the rulers who are exploiting other rest of humanity. And... Uh, <clears throat> so rather than seeing it as a human weakness, yes, there are some people who have vice within them. 
There are some people who have greed, some people who have envy, some people have arrogance, and they exploit others. And this can be present in men. This can be present in women. So we need to draw human lessons from history, and especially from the epics, and ultimately spiritual lessons. We don't want to reread history as a story of exploitation of one gender by another gender. So you know there can be two ways of reading scripture. There is reading from scriptures, and there is reading into scriptures. So reading into scriptures means we have our preconceptions, and we reduce scripture so that it fits into our preconceptions. Uh, As I said over here, we superimpose our values on scriptures, and judge ancient characters according to today's standards. Well, every culture has its own way of functioning, and within that way of functioning, if the idea was that say. all women were exploited throughout history now anybody who reads the ramayana and reads the mahabharat they'll see that draupadi's character draupadi's personality is very different from sita's personality they're two they both strong women but they're strong in different ways they have their own individual identity so just as there is diversity in male characters there is diversity in female characters that if you look at the ramayana itself kaikeya and kaushalya have different characters Gandhari is strong in her own way. Kunti is strong in her own way. The individuality of the characters in the epics also come of the female characters also comes out. It is not like a singular tale that all women were just homogeneously exploited by everyone else. So when we read into scripture, then it is our preconceptions that are being forced into on that are being forced onto scripture. So what we want to do is we want to read scripture, read from scripture. read from scripture means that we understand the culture and the values of those times before judging the actions of the characters over there that way when we study then we can actually benefit from this reading of the scriptures now <clears throat> till now i discussed that what ahalya story is not then what is ahalya story it is as said ahalya had a moment of weakness and everybody can have moments of weakness and sometimes circumstantially you know, we have a moment of weakness and circumstances can make that moment of weakness terrible i think i was in mit last no no 2 3 years ago and how the students were telling a story of how there was this indian boy you know iit topper who had come to america to get, and he got into mit and he seems to be from a good south indian family very cultured and his friends told him now you are in mit let's go for a drink he apparently had never drunk so he went to his drinking party he drank with his friends and then they all were drunk and they had to go back to their hostel from the bar and then he uh there was nobody to drive their car so he drove the car and now first of all driving under alcoholic influence you are itself is it's a serious crime so he drove and somehow at that time he drove from school district and his car ran over a child and that led to such an escalation that eventually this boy was deported from there so now he was not alcoholic he was not a insane he was not a murderous human being but sometimes destiny works in such a way that there is a small mistake on our part it says we have a moment of weakness his moment of weakness was he drank at that time and then somehow that that moment of weakness a storm comes in our life and things can fall apart so sometimes uh, it's we make a big mistake and sometimes we get very little consequences of that sometimes we make a small mistake and we get big consequences of that why is that well from a from the perspective of karma we understand that you know the re results we get right now are not just of our present actions also past actions come together Uh, so i give that example sometimes moments of weakness can have severe reactions so we discuss about feminist readings now we'll discuss about how from this moment of weakness uh so kahalya had a moment of weakness and for that she was cursed now why was she cursed so disproportionately one reason is that ultimately if we see everything is happening from the from the perspective of the lord orchestrating everything so this also illustrates how the world may judge but the lord does not judge the lord forgives and rewards so 
अपिचेत सुदुराचारो भजते माम अन्य भा साधुरे वस मंतव्य समझ व्यवस्थित हो सर even if somebody has done something terribly wrong the lord says that you are that i still accept you i still you are still you are still to be considered a devotee so actually krishna is telling don't judge my devotees if they do something wrong even if they do something terribly wrong don't use that behavior alone as the sole parameter for judging them if overall they are living a life of devotion you should see that they see their devotional intention not their anti devotional action so the world judges and so her husband judged her and punished her but ram didn't judge her ram as soon as ram came in contact with her ram forgave her so what happens is let's look at this the lord looked at his feet so what happened to ahalya is that she when ram came there to the forest he was passing by that forest and he saw that this this, this place looks very strange it is uh, it is supposed to be a hermitage but it seemed to be deserted and it was deserted but there's nothing growing over there except there was one place where there was a stone and on that stone a tulsi was growing so he was with the he was with traveling with some sages and he asked them what's happening over here and they told that this is actually this stone is actually ahalya who was cursed by gautam muni and then they told the whole story and that at, at, when ahalya had fallen at uh, gautam muni's feet and she had said please forgive me the so gautam muni said that yes you know i've cursed you now i cannot take back the curse but you will be delivered by ram when he comes here in the future so when ram heard his story ram came forward and he just touched that stone with his feet and as soon as he touched that stone immediately ahalya got her form back and she was restored she was restored and there was no judgment against her and she and gautam muni they had both performed great austerity so both of them were elevated to a higher destination thereafter so this was how they all moved forward so now ram's just his lotus feet they transformed they delivered her so that was both at one level the mercifulness of the lord is seen through these past times and the lord lotus feet has miraculous potency so but the overall principle here is that oh, why did ahal is the kirtan sound disturbing you hari krishna no prabhu ji no no okay if it gets too loud let me know i'll try to close the windows over here oh the windows are actually closed yeah so now why was she made into a stone so why was she made in she caused to become a stone the stone represents a stage of very diminished consciousness in fact we consider if somebody like a stone hearted when you say they are stone hearted that means they have no emotions they are not like uh, they just emotionless they are how can somebody be so cruel so hard hearted how can somebody have no emotions so we could say stone represents a state of extremely diminished consciousness extremely diminished consciousness and normally souls get different kinds of bodies and aquatics are considered to be the lowest among the hierarchy from aquatics then there are chaljana lakshani stavar laksham imshati like that the aquatics and the plants and then it moves upward in the hierarchy so whichever way it is the stones are not normally considered to be uh, bodies for souls in some cases some stones might be conscious in the sense that they have some very little level of consciousness that could be because of some special reason that stone might be like a body for a particular soul like govardhan is a special stone special mountain it's not just a stone it's a mountain so in very rare cases stones might be uh might be conscious in of course stones are never conscious but they might contain a being with consciousness but that's extremely rare normally stones are seen as a state of no consciousness at all and so when ahalya was reduced to a stone 
by the curse of uh, gautam muni the idea is that she her consciousness shrunk substantially and why did her consciousness shrink that was a consequence of her actions so in general what was her action her action was she succumbed to the temptation when indra came to her and that temp- succumbing to the temptation itself indicates a diminution of her consciousness so what happens i'll explain why that indicates diminishing of her consciousness and how there is a reaction to that but broadly we can look at the story from the terms of consciousness and how consciousness is affected by various things so whenever say for example somebody engages in sensuality now when people are engaged in sensuality that diminishes their consciousness how does it diminish say for example if somebody eats meat then we need to objectify the animal if we really treat the animal as a l- living loving conscious being then it's not so easy to just slaughter it and then consume it so most people they so our consciousness has to shrink so that we treat the treat the animal like a object and that happens in today's society in many different ways that it, the whole animal slaughter houses they are call, they are all called euphemistically as the meat packing industry as if you know meat is available in nature all that we do is just pack it and give it to you in a nice package no there has to be ki- this killing so for somebody to eat meat they have to desensitize themselves to the to the consciousness of the animals so when you talk about shrinking of consciousness means what that i am my consciousness is no longer there to be conscious of what the animal is experiencing so shrinking of consciousness means one is self obsessed expansion of consciousness means one is aware of realities beyond oneself so meat eating it shrinks our consciousness and uh if <clears throat> those who actually interact with animals and live with animals especially the loving with this we cannot eat animals like this so when similarly if somebody has somebody if somebody is the sexual assault then what happens is they don't see the the victim as a person it's a object it's just a form which i want to bend and twist and penetrate for my pleasure so it sees the and if at all you see the object as a person that per- that is a that is a sadistic mentality where i can i get my sense of power by causing pain to the other person but basically the consciousness shrinks without that kind of shrinking of consciousness one cannot actually force oneself on someone so that ob- there is objectification now when we say objectification means what we no longer treating that person as a subject as a conscious being so to treat a conscious being as a object that means our consciousness has shrunk so that we are no longer perceiving or caring for the emotions of the other person so that is a shrinking of consciousness now i suppose somebody gluttony is uh, gluttony is overeating we have the shadrupus in our tradition the um, the six anarthas the stanger greed and we pride and illusion so in christianity there are seven great sins and one that most of them are similar one that is different in christianity is called gluttony so gluttony means from our perspective we could call it as atyahar and prayasa from the upadeshamrut's perspective just overeating and over endeavoring for overeating so now if somebody overeats say if there are 10 gulab jamuns made for 10 people and somebody goes secretly and eats all the gulab jamuns themselves then what is happening is their consciousness is shrunk so they're not even considering that others also have desires others should also enjoy others, should, others will also feel, uh, feel they will feel pain if they don't they will feel unhappy they will feel distressed if they don't get this food so that uh, my desires are all that matter and others desires or even needs don't matter and now it's one thing to take a dessert but if somebody somebody eats all the food and they don't leave any food for others that's gluttony <laughs> that's undesirable so one can actually not be a glutton if one is conscious of others Now imagine if two people are taking a meal 
and both of them are hungry and there's only one chapati then i mean a civilized person won't just grab the whole chapati and take it themselves will share it and if they are culture will say no you both of will say you take it you take it but gluttony means one doesn't even when the gluttony reference is to thinking of consciousness when one doesn't even think about the other person so so now in that same way there's infidelity infidelity is here it refers to say what what uh, ahalya did with gautam rishi so what happened is that at that time when one does that one's consciousness is, that also indicates the diminishing of one's consciousness what is the diminishing that one thinks only of oneself and one's pleasure and doesn't think of how one's actions are going to affect one's partner so ahalya by her actions she so she when indra came before her, it was a moment of weakness but even even in the moment of weakness what one does it varies from person to person now somebody might say hey, they are in a supermarket and they say nobody is watching maybe the security cameras are off because the power has gone off then they might shoplift hmm they might just steal something and take it with them but people who shoplift they may if there is some guard over there or there is some attendance over there they may not hit that attendance and injure them and then go away no that's beyond me so everybody has their limits of what they will do and what they will not do so in this case ahalya crossed a line and in her sense her crossing the line indicates the shrinking of her consciousness that she was not con- conscious of her duty and how her actions would affect mm, affect uh, gautam rishi so then now it was we could say it was gautam rishi's anger because of which he cursed but scriptures also exhibit certain principles through extreme examples dramatic or extreme examples so what are those extreme examples so extreme examples means we say bharat we see uh, king king bharat he gets attached to a deer and he becomes a deer and say somebody who's renounced the world how in the wide world will they become attached to a deer it seems so trivial and then they end up becoming a deer because of that that seems quite shocking but that's a extreme example to illustrate the danger of worldly attachment and how from any one from anywhere can become diverted so similarly this story and the cursing of ahalya is an extreme example of how sensual indulgence diminishes one's consciousness so normally the more one indulges in sensuality the more one's consciousness starts diminishing 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 and the heart starts becoming more and more stone like so if somebody say for example somebody is born in a uh, butcher's family then at that time say the son of of a animal killer of animal slaughterer then most time they have to kill an animal they mean actually to kill a chicken or something like that they, they may not the, the hand will hesitate but still they will kill it they kill it which that son kills him and then first time he kills with hesitation second time is the hesitation Tenth time, he might just be chit-chatting with a friend while he just lops off the necks off and uh, cuts the animals. So he may cut animals the way we cut sabji. So what has happened is consciousness has become more and more shrunk. It has become desensitized. So the more one does a particular engage in sensual indulge, repeated actually sensual. Sorry, it's sensual um, indulgence. the words are remarkably similar indulgence and intolerance so so what way happen gradually in people that is dem- demonstrated suddenly and extre- extremely in scripture so what happens is if somebody repeatedly engages in sensuality then their heart will become stone like mm-hmm. but in ahalya's case because of a curse her whole body became stone like mm. and not the stone like it became a stone So the principle of the complete diminishing of consciousness is illustrated in a dramatic way, and then what does the Lord touching her lotus feet, Lord touching her with His lotus feet represent? If our consciousness has shrunk, one of the most potent ways to expand the consciousness is to bring it in contact with the Lord. When the consciousness, the Lord is the greatest being; He is the supreme being. and when our consciousness comes in contact with him our consciousness expands the bhagavad gita uses the word mahatma to refer to those who are devoted to the lord mahatmanas tumam partha 
So as I said, there are extreme examples. I'll move to that. The extreme examples, they catch attention and highlight the universal principles. So today in that the extreme examples are not, not the standard, they're not the universal, but what is standard is highlighted through extreme examples. So <clears throat> now the expansion of consciousness happened by Ahalya touching Ram's feet. Now similarly, or Ahalya being touched by Ram's feet. So if we contact the Lord in any manifestation, our consciousness can also expand. I was talking about the word Mahatma. Uh, the, the Jiva is actually very Anu. It is Keshagra Satabhagasya Satada Kalpi Dasicha. One ten thousand the tip of a hair. So why the soul, how can the soul ever be called a Mahatma? Actually what happens is the soul's consciousness expands till the consciousness becomes fixed on the Supreme Being. So Mahatma Anastu Maampartha Daivim Prakriti Mashrita Bhajanti Ananya Manaso Gyatva Bhuta Adi Mogve. So contact with the Lord expands our consciousness. So for all of us in various ways, our consciousness may be shrunk to different degrees. But if we can be blessed by contact with the Lord, uh, through the holy name, through the scripture, through the deities, through the association of devotees, through various forms of services, then our consciousness can also expand. And Bhakti Yoga practice is actually a means for us to bring our consciousness in contact with Krishna, to invest our consciousness in the Lord. And then it expands. When our consciousness expands, what happens? Our It expands, making our life deeper, richer and sweeter. The, the more we can experience Krishna and the more we can experience Krishna in different ways, the more we perceive reality differently from what ordinary people perceive. And Prabhupada was going for a morning walk once and at that time, the devotees somehow, they normally used to take him to some garden or some lake, something nice scenic place. And somehow they lost way and they took him to a, a ghetto-like place. And the devotees are apologizing, Prabhupada, this is not a very attractive place. And Prabhupada says, what's not attractive? This is Vaikuntha. He says, we are here and we are discussing about Krishna. And wherever Krishna is talking about, that is Vaikuntha. So, Yatra Gayanti Mad Bhakta Tasya Narada. So for Prabhupada, he had that vision where he could experience Krishna everywhere. And when Prabhupada went to America, he didn't see America as a land of material opportunity. He saw that as a land of spiritual opportunity. As a place where he could share Krishna Bhakti with people. So life can be experienced in a different way when our consciousness expanded. So just as the lotus feet of Ram uh, expand, restore Ahalya to her, to her normal form, Similarly, contact with the Lord can also restore the soul to its normal form. That is, the soul's eternal spiritual position, where there is expanded consciousness that, is, that leads to a blissful life, which is deep, rich and sweet because of the experience of Krishna and life in relationship with Krishna. So I'll summarize what I spoke and then we can have a few comments or questions. So I spoke today on the topic of the shrinking and expansion of consciousness. In that connection, I spoke briefly the story of Ahalya, how she was cursed because, uh, because apparently Indra, Indra impersonated and misled her. But the significant detail is that it was not that Indra misled her. Yes, Indra did try to mislead her, but she also knew and she went along. And then we discussed about how lust, how male and female psychology vary. Men desire women, women desire the desire of men. And then in that connection, I discussed how temptations can come in different ways rather than seeing it as men exploit women because of lust. Other lust expresses itself in different ways in everyone. And we have to see it that we are all meant to be partners in fighting this common enemy. It's the enemy of the whole world. And then I talked about feminist readings of the epics that feminism holds that Ahalya was a victim. Well, Ahalya was not wicked like uh, Indra was, and Indra was cursed severely for that. But Ahalya had a moment of weakness. So feminist readings, they read all of history as women exploiting men, or sorry, men exploiting women rather. They talk about how feminism originally started off as, from a historical circumstance, yes, women should get opportunities that should not be deprived of opportunities because of being women. From there it is, we have been, we have been put down. So now, we will, we will put down men and we will reread history in a way that portrays 
but in unflattering light. And that is how epics are also read. So reading that way is actually not just unfair to men, it is also unfair to women. Because say, I look at the characters in the epics, they are, even the female characters are very strong characters. Just their strength is expressed in a different way. So just as Ram did a glorious sacrifice to honor uh, Dashrath's words, so Sita did a glorious sacrifice to honor Ram's the words and Ram's reputation. Just as Dashrath did a sacrifice, sorry, Ram did a sacrifice to honor Dashrath's reputation. So does that make Ram a victim? No. That is Ram is that is Ram's uh, glory that he could do it, and similarly Sita's glory that he could do, she could do it. So we discussed how characters are multifaceted. That was Shurpanka a victim? No, Shurpanka was also a manipulator. She tried to manipulate, and it was she who actually uh, manipulated Ravan, and she initially wanted to get Ram. So character Draupadi is a strong character to treat her as a victim is wrong. Like she comes out, her character comes out strongest in the disrobing, uh, disrobing tragedy, at the attempted disrobing tragedy. So then we discussed about to think that all of human history is men have exploited women. No, that is re completely distorted reading. Both men and women were just together trying their best to face life's challenges. Life is extremely difficult. And yes, was there exploitation? Yes, there are few men who were tyrannical. They exploited and sometimes if women got power, they have also been tyrannical in some ways. So rather than seeing this as, I'm not saying that women are bad and men are good. I'm saying that we are all facing the forces of illusion. And if we start fighting among each other, then it is we are getting into illusion and we are not really fighting the forces of illusion. So then we discussed about how Ahalya was restored by the touch of Ram's lotus feet. And that represents not just the Lord's potency. The, Lord's, the Lord forgave uh, where the world had judged her, the Lord forgave her. And uh, then the contact of the Lord's Lord feet can expand our consciousness. So whenever we engage in sensual activities, that shrinks or diminishes our consciousness. Why? Because to gratify ourselves in particular ways, we have to objectify the objects that we are using for our gratification. So meat eating means that we objectify the animals. We don't see them as conscious beings. And like that for various things I discussed. So sensuality diminishes our consciousness. And by repeated sensual indulgence, our conscious, consciousness will become like that of a, like a stone. So scriptures sometimes describe uh, the, describe sometimes, uh, how do we put it? Sometimes describe in extreme or sudden examples what happens gradually. So by repeated indulgence, our stone consciousness may become stone-like. But in the Ahalya's case, she became like a stone. She became a stone in one moment. And she was restored by Ram's lotus feet touching her. And similarly, any way we, if we contact the Lord, then our consciousness can also expand and be, uh, be, uh, be expanded. Our consciousness can be expanded and thus we can be restored to our spiritual life eternally. So, yes. Let's see if we have there some questions. Do the scriptures, you were mentioning that the scriptures use extreme example uh, to teach us some values. So, do the scriptures use extreme examples to create a sense of fear? How should we uh, present these in a modern context where people seem to be more attracted by inspiring examples rather than some, something that creates fear? Good question. So, do the scriptures do the scriptures use fear when it is using showing such extreme examples? Well, yes. Fear is also one level of deterrence. You know that there is fear, desire, duty, and love, and you could say these apply in every area of life. So, if we consider the nation, there are. There are people who love the country and they are ready to sacrifice their lives for the country. If somebody attacks the country, they will be at the borders fighting. If there are uprisings, there will be activists trying to protect the country, uh, doing various things. So that is, that is the level of love. But for some people, love is required. For some people, fear is required. Now, if they say the police go on strike, then what will happen? Most criminals don't strike because they have some... They don't strike, strike in the sense that they... 
they don't uh, do rampant criminal activities because they have some fear of the law recently in america when this de defund the police movement was there was there's agitation and there were riots and uh, there were protests which protests became riots and riots lead to robberies and all kind of things and the police were told to lay low and what happened was people just went wild so the point is that fear we shouldn't minimize or trivialize fear as a motivation also it's an important motivation it is required at a particular level yes in today's world definitely because there is a high level of skepticism and fear is seen as a tool for controlling people and religion is often used to see religion is often used to is often seen as a also a agents by which certain people control other people and they use fear as a tool that's a common rereading of religion which uh, some of the psychologists did and it has become quite mainstream so prabhupada himself didn't talk much about uh, say hell all the fifth canto he describes the hell but he doesn't talk about it in his classes he doesn't say or oh, if you're going to do this you're going to go to hell if you want to do this you're going to go to hell no if, even if he talks strongly against uh, sensual indulgence against sense gratification his thrust is that that is not real happiness you are meant for far better happiness so he's, uh, and he does talk about how it leads to distress but the distress he doesn't talk so much that you will have to go to hell and suffer because that approach doesn't work in today's world so yes we don't have to talk about fear so much but as far as these kind of stories are concerned if somebody asks the question then we we explain in as reasonable a way as possible as i said firstly we don't have to discount the principle of fear but we don't have to highlight that alone so usually the best way to present scripture is is you know to carefully select stories and then tell some philosophical principles from them if if it is our choice if we are presenting we don't have to present controversial stories right in the beginning to new people now of course if it's only swearing philosophy that might not interest people so we need to tell stories but we have to carefully select the stories and once there is some basic level of understanding and appreciation and faith then controversial stories can also be uh, explained and people it will make sense to them the otherwise if we start with controversial stories then it becomes a little difficult for people to accept unless we can really present in a way that makes sense to them and then they become attracted so does it answer your question yes prabhu ji thank you very much yeah uh anirudh and nitachan prabhu you can ask your question thank you prabhu uh, thank you for for giving this amazing discussion especially on expansion and shrinking of consciousness i mean it is so relevant in the current world and also describing this past time so nicely of ahalla i mean i have read kind of uh about the two super plus two was book on naman you want i didn't read but uh i think it was very much much more uh kind of analytical the way you present so my question actually was uh about i remember you mentioned one of the points actually it was so difficult to <laughs> take my attention away when you were explaining i mean everything there was so much nice information there so one thing i actually kind of missed i think or didn't understand well is uh you mentioned that there is kind of suppose somebody is exploiting and somebody uh, uh, i mean in one way another person is exploiting in another way and then there is some kind of some other emotion also you mentioned like i don't know what it is like what somebody is thinking when somebody else is exploiting or like when somebody else is exploiting what he is thinking of the other person i mean was there any other emotional element that you mentioned on that i remember you mentioned something actually but i missed that uh with respect to which context are talking about other emotion uh, exploiting you were mentioning that like somebody is exploiting when somebody else is feeling about that and also similarly when the other person is exploiting like what the previous person was thinking something like that you're saying i mean there is okay. some kind of mental which is involved there you're mentioning no so quite often when i said that um there are can, can be some extreme situations where the one person is exploiting and other person is exploited but quite often it is both people are playing games both people are trying to you could talk it negatively you could talk it positively now both if you want to talk it negatively both people are trying to use the other person 
so no shurpankha used ravan to grind her own axe and ravan used shurpankha as a pretext for attacking ram and you know you did this to my sister i'm going to do this to you so at one level when we act so suppose you know two people quarrel with each other they might be the best of they might have the best they might be husband wife they might be bra- siblings they might be very close friends so now now when we are very close to each other what happens is we also know we also come to know each other's weaknesses we also come to know each other's uh, points where you can hurt the most so in the bible there is the story of how adam and eve were tempted by first eve was tempted by the snake who was supposed to be satan and then they ate and when they ate the food they became they developed self awareness and the bible says they came to know and they started became self conscious oh we are undressed and then they went and hid themselves and then it is said that they also developed a sense of awareness of good and evil now what how is that related the idea is that say when somebody is unclothed in one way they are defenseless and then you can hurt the when you when somebody is defenseless then we can then the other person they can be hurt severely and evil means to cause pain simply for the purpose of causing pain so if we know if we know somebody very well then there is awareness of that person we also know their weaknesses so sometimes uh, either sarcastically or intentionally we might speak deliberately speak words that are going to hurt that other person the most now when we do that we know that this is going to hurt the other person we still speak that and then we get some sense of joy you know i, I scored a hit you know you speak like this to me you do like this and i'll do this to you and then what is happening then we are not when we are consciously hurting somebody else uh, then we are seeing that person even their pain as a source of our pleasure and then they might do the same thing to us because they might also know our weaknesses and then they might speak something which hurts us they might speak it right to us they might speak it behind our backs they might spread some humors about us and that may agitate us so what happens is both people in that case they are this they n- no longer see the other person as a person with emotions as a feeling conscious being if even if i see the other person as a person with emotions i am seeing that other person's emotions as a means to cause them maximum pain i hope this is clear that normally if our consciousness expanded we don't want to cause pain to someone say if i am walking along a road and usually i use crutches for walking so i have to be careful sometimes you know if i press i am walking with the crutches and my crutches uh, fall on somebody's feet then my whole body weight will come on that person's feet It can be very painful for them so i am cautious so if i see somebody's feet over there then i will move my crutches aside or they will i'll ask them to move their feet aside but suppose while walking i deliberately put the crutches on somebody's feet then that is being horrible so if i if say somebody does like that and they have they want to cause pain to the other person and when they see that other person's pain they feel joy in it so what has happened is their consciousness has diminished so that the other person's pain is no longer the other person's pain the other person's pain is a tool for my pleasure so that is how i objectify the other person so that's how people might objectify each other and that's why sometimes they may hurt each other in the most painful of ways uh, so that's how this mutual exploitation can come in when there are uh, when there are adversarial relationships does it address your question thank you prabhu yes please thank you chetan so uh, uh shankaran prabhu you can ask your follow up question Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. So, Pramila, since you are mentioning about Surpanka, uh, she exploited uh, 
Brahmana. Hmm. So I've also heard that uh, Surpanka was determined to destroy Ramana. Uh, I don't know how, how authentic it is, but this also says that because Ramana killed her husband, so she had taken a vow that she would destroy Ramana. And she was looking for Renu, how to destroy him. And when she confronted Lord Ramchandra, she understood that, okay, this is the good way to destroy him. And that's how she deliberately created animosity between Ravana and Lord Ramchandra to this uh, episode. That's true. So, so is, is, is yeah. it true? I'll, you, thought, I'll, I'll explain that, yeah, surely. Thank you for bringing this up. So, <clears throat> so there is Ramayana. In the Valmiki Ramayana, there is no mention of Shurpanakha's husband and uh, Ravan killing that husband. But there are many stories associated with the Ramayana tradition. And I'll first tell the story and then I'll talk about the authenticity. See, now there are many books which have been written about the Ramayana. And sometimes some stories come for which we don't even know the sources. We may do some research and find some sources. Sometimes you're not able to find also. So the broad story goes that Shurpanakha husband was also a very powerful demon. In some places, her husband is called as Dushta Buddhi. That was his name. And she was... Uh, she... Uh, now, because Dushta Buddhi was a threat, because he was so powerful, Ravan felt he might be a threat for me. And he sent Dushta Buddhi on a military expedition against some enemies. And then he told the other soldiers and generals to, to, to move ahead. So that everybody attacked Dushta Buddhi and Dushta Buddhi was killed. So it was thought that he was killed in the war, but was killed not by the enemy, but he was killed by Ravana's plan only. So initially, Shurpanka was grief struck. And then afterward, she came to know what had happened. And she was enraged with Ravana, but she couldn't do anything herself. And eventually when she got... She, so she, initially, she went with the desire of getting Sita because she was, she didn't have a husband. She was also attracted to Ram. So she, initially, she went to get Ram and she did attack Sita. And at that time, Ram was just an attractive person for her. But when she went back to Kar and Dushan and told, her, told them, and then Kar and Dushan attacked her, and Ram killed all of them single-handed. That's when she thought that oh, Ram can be the person by which I can get back to Ravan. So that's the way that story goes. So now, uh, how do we look at the stories which are about the Ramayana, which are not there, say, in the Valmiki Ramayana? Now, there are some devotees who may highlight prominently that even the story of, say, Shabari offering uh, those fruits, those berries, to Ram, that is also not mentioned in the Valmiki Ramayana. Or even the Lakshman Rekha is not mentioned in the Valmiki Ramayana. And some devotees may highlight those points very much. So, yes, but if you look at the Ramayana, it's a living tradition. And if you consider the Lord's pastimes, the Lord can reveal his pastimes at different times, to different degrees. No one book can exhaustively describe all pastimes. And even in our tradition, many pastimes that are... Hmm, that are what is the word? not described in the Ramayana are described as part of the Ramayana. Not described in the Ramayana means uh, not described in Valmiki Ramayana. So when Nityananda Prabhu is uh, when Nityananda Prabhu is having his childhood plays, at that time he performs various Ram Leela. And one of the Leelas that he performs is when Hanuman is going to Lanka. At that time, Ravan sends a, or rather, and Hanuman is going from Lanka to the Himalayas to get this jadi booties, get his medicinal herbs. So, Ravan sends a demon, and the demon impersonates as a sage. And he, he pretends to be a devotee of Ram and is chanting Ram, Ram's names, and he tries to divert and attack and kill Hanuman. Some of you may have seen this story in the Ramayana also, in the televised Ramayana, wherever. But the point is, this story is not there in the Valmiki Ramayana. And in the in the enactment of the pastimes of Nityananda Prabhu, by Nityananda Prabhu of Lord Ram, they enact this pastime also. That means this pastime which is not in the Valmiki Ramayana, 
was ex- was in a- was accepted by Nityananda Prabhu as an authentic pastime because they enacted it. So we- they wouldn't enact a non-authentic pastime. So we can't restrict the Ramayana to one book alone. At the same time, we can't like be like open book and anybody can come and tell anything. So there are extremes. There is there is something called Jain Ramayana. And Jain Ramayana is a, like I said, read into scripture. That's one of the most uh, scandalous examples. If we could call it scandalous or we could call it ludicrous. So what happens in the Jain Ramayana? So the Jains saw that Ram is very popular. And so they decided to use Ram to pro- spread, spread Jainism. Now, how do you do that? So they had this basically more of the same story of the Ramayana. Some twists are there. But the major difference in the Valmiki Ramayana and the Jain Ramayana is that whenever Ram is in the forest, all the sages he meets in the forest are Jains. And they all teach Jain philosophy to Ram. And at the end, in the Jain Ramayana, when Sita goes to the forest and Sita enters into the earth, rather, then Ram renounces the world and becomes an enlightened Jain. So <laughs> that is the way they told the story. So the point I'm saying is that we can't reduce the Ramayana only to the Valmiki Ramayana. But at the same time, we can't have like an open book where we, ca- we can't make it like a completely open book where something like Jain Ramayana can be accepted. So the tradition itself has overall accepted and not accepted some stories. By tradition, I don't mean like one, one body which authorizes. But one example which we could use is that it's like a musical performance. Say one person sings. And when that person is singing, somebody else then comes and starts playing an instrument. And somebody else comes and starts playing an instrument. And somebody else comes and play, starts playing an instrument. And then from a, one, a solo singing performance, it becomes an orchestra. And it's, it's much more attractive. However, if somebody starts coming and playing, a completely different instrument that doesn't fit into orchestra and say you have to start playing it wrongly, then it will get, get out, get out, get out. No, you can't be here. So similarly, what we can say is that that the Valmiki Ramayana is like the original music, original singing performance. And then the various retellings of the Ramayana, they are like the orchestra troupe. So the say for example, in the Ram Charit Manas or the Kamba Ramayana, or in many of these retellings of the regional retellings of the Ramayana, the devotional element comes out much more than in the Valmiki Ramayana also. Because the Valmiki Ramayana's focus is much more on demonstrating how Ram is the ideal human being. And that's why Ram's divinity is not emphasized so much. It's not denied, it's told clearly. But Ram's divinity is not emphasized so much. Because if he's God, then he's already perfect. Then, oh, he could do it because he's God, then... I can't do it. I'm just a human being. So Ram as the ideal human being is stressed. So Ram's divinity is not stressed that much in the Valmiki Ramayana. So in the Valmiki Ramayana, there are no examples of, you know, there are characters offering profuse prayers to Ram. But in the Ram Charitmanas, they are there. In the Kamba Ramayana, they are there. And of course, the Ram Bhakti tradition, they are of course there. So what happens is, the sometimes the Bhakti element is seen more in the later retellings than in the original epic also. It's just like, the additional musical performers, they enhance the orchestra. So we, can, so we could say that the various retellings are like that. But when a retelling starts uh, diverting, so there are retellings which can add additional detail which is not given in the epics. Then that is something which can be accepted. But when the retellings start contradicting the original storyline, or they start speaking something which goes against either the storyline or the rasa. Then it becomes a problem. So then that becomes like a, a musical performance which is out of sync with the rest of the orchestra. Then that cannot be accepted. So in general, we cannot monopolize or uh, monopolize or reduce the tradition to only one thing. But that doesn't mean we can just make it a free for all for everyone. So with respect to the Ramayana, uh, there are there is a lot of uh, stories about the Ram Leela, about Ram Leela that was not there in the Valmiki Ramayana, and uh, I would say this is this is a story one of those those stories, 
I don't see any way this story goes against the storyline of uh, the Valmiki Ramayana, and so I would not object to anyone quoting it. And if it context required, I might quote it also. But it's but we don't really have a like one sanctioning authority who's going to say this this story is acceptable or this story is not acceptable. That's so. When I have written my book on the Ramayana and I talk with other devotees. this is the broad criteria i understood by uh, by talking with um, traditional ramayana scholars from outside our tradition that how to accept a story not accept a story so that same principle applies to krishna lila also if you go to rindavan there are so many vraja katha that are told by the vrajavasis and we won't we won't find them in any books most famously the story of the uh, the gopis offering the dust of their lotus feet to krishna that story is not found in the uh, in not only in the 10th canto bhagavatam but even in the goswami literature it is not found but it goes so well it in fact few other stories illustrate the mood of the gopi selfless love as well as the story does so that story is celebrated in our tradition although its source is unknown so we could say that is loka pramana it is the shastra pramana rupa goswami talks about and there is loka pramana so this story will form in fall in loka pramana so i would say the shri prakash stories can also fall in that loka pramana does it answer the question Shankaran Prabhu, you are on mute. Okay, we can move on to next question, probably. Yes, sure. Uh, so we probably you have time, so we have around around seven questions here. Seven, huh? Okay, let's see. We'll we'll go we'll go till ten thirty, ten thirty-five. We started at ten eight thirty-five, my time. So we'll go for about two hours, and we can take question next time then. पर्सन वॉज नॉट हर हजब so as a yogini she could perceive beyond the appearance so that's how the ramayana clearly says that she knew that it was her husband which it was not her husband it is indra who had come that way and she felt captivated that she felt elated in the sense that oh the king of gods has gone so far to try to be with me okay we have uh, heard that um, she is very pious lady one of the um, like sati kind one of the very pious lady very chaste women so so uh, this doesn't go with that uh, idea yeah that's true see the idea that when scriptures talk about some chaste women and uh, it gives certain ideals now the scriptures sometimes give ideals who are completely flawless sometimes sometimes scriptures give ideals who were flawed and then they become flawless also so it's not that there has one has to have a completely blemishless record throughout to be considered an ideal the different characters who may act in different ways at different times but if eventually they attain perfection prabhupada would give the example that if somebody is a millionaire whether they was born millionaire or they became a millionaire now they are millionaires that is important so not that every single action of every single character is to be considered ideal that eventual the place where they arrived at is considered ideal so ahilya is like that so eventually you now she she did something wrong she overcame she got went through the punishment for that and she reunited with her husband and she was chaste so and she re, became re, restored in the position of chastity with her husband and that's how she is considered glorious so the scriptures are in that sense inclusive they don't uh, they don't, don't Like somebody who is flawed can never become ideal. It's not like that. Somebody may be flawed; they may also become ideal in future. So, how did uh, there's another related question which I'm seeing? Do you want to ask that, Vijay Prabhu? Ah, uh, sure, Prabhu. Ah, uh, 
Radhakunda Madhuji, you can ask it. Yeah. Prabhuji, I have been hearing. Thank you so much. Um, the answer you have given to Dada Mataji relating to the same question. But um, now I am not understanding. She is a Gautama Rushi's wife and she is a yogini, as you mentioned. And uh, what exactly, you know, uh, caused her allurement to the opulences of Indra? Um, and uh, finally, my another question is like, you know, um, same relating to this. Um, by the touch of Lord Ramachandra, did she attain a the perfection and she went back to the godhead okay. finally yeah so how could ahalya if she's a yogini how could she get tempted by indra's opulence well it was not just indra's opulence it's not she had no intention that i will go to swargaloka and be become shachi or replace shachi that was not the idea that was it was that just that indra the king of gods he wants to be with me and he has gone through so much effort so he has he's done all this to be with me so she felt gratified by that and she succumbed now how could she succumb well human weakness is there in everyone we can ask how bharat maharaj could have got so attached to a deer after he renounced his family and his kingdom tell that we, it's a tale of uh, human history is a tale of uh, human fallibilities in some ways the scriptures describe that and it's not just uh, ahalya we have sages getting angry we have sages getting tempted we have vishwamitra and so many other sages who get tempted so vishwamitra was a great sage but still he got tempted so when she came when uh, ramba and others came then uh, he got tempted at that time or he got angry at one time so so the temptation does temptation can overpower even even say a sage who was focused on trying to uh do austerity uh, even that sage was tempted then what to speak of a woman who was not at that time focused on she was just going about her duty and uh, due to the daily life and suddenly this temptation came upon her so you know, the world is a place of uh, place of temptation and sometimes even the best of us can fall prey that's why we need uh, need to, to be empathic we need to be understanding now as far as her eventual destination see the epics the ramayana and the mahabharat while they talk about dharma they don't themselves emphasize bhakti so much the the bhakti tradition does talk about how there are bhakti lessons in the ramayana and the mahabharat but these are more about dharma so being about dharma the purpose they show they don't talk so much about the spiritual world per se in the vedic tradition there is the average trajectory for elevation is that if somebody is punya then by punya they will go to swarga hmm? then there are extraordinary people who will practice bhakti and go to the spiritual world beyond this material world itself those are very rare manushya naam sahasreshu krishna speaking this one among that they are one among thousands and he is speaking that at the time of at the time before kali yuga had started when he spoke the bhagavad gita so it's always been very rare so the mahabharamayan doesn't talk so much about uh, vaikuntha or the spiritual world ramayan talks about uh, swarga and uh, the higher worlds so so where exactly she went she she attended a elevated destination that's what is described so would she it's so a basically she went with her husband to an elevated destination so was it uh, the spiritual world was it the some higher lokas like the, the tapa loka or somewhere where people go and perform austerities and then they become elevated that's not clearly mentioned so generally the ramayana doesn't go too much into the uh, to the levels of higher higher destinations It talks about somebody attaining a higher destination that's the level of specificity in the ramayana okay thank you so much prabhu ji thank you dhanyawad hey, hari krishna so oh, one anonymous question so mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, <laughs> apichet uh, uh, sudracharo and uh, one should not deride a devotee for accidental fall down so we understand that lord will forgive the devotee for accidental fall down example the person physically abused someone but how can the other victim forgive the devotee how can api chechura sudra chora be applied here that's tough so if somebody has been victimized say physically abused by someone then the lord may forgive 
but how can the victim forgive yeah that's why um, maybe in a future session we'll talk about this principle that there is there's the principle of forgiveness and there's the principle of justice and both go in parallel generally in spiritual traditions forgiveness is emphasized and it's important all of us we can and should be more forgiving in our day to day interactions but there are times when uh, when uh, you know it's not the issue has become so serious it's not a matter of forgiving it's a matter of seeking justice so we could say that why did ram just forgive ravan and let sita let him have sita no he couldn't do that you know, because sita was his wife and he had a duty to protect her so he had to fight and he didn't fight to take revenge he fight to fought to get justice for sita so sometimes uh, forgiveness may be there uh, in the heart but externally justice may have to be sought so i'd say that if there is abuse then uh, then of course abuse is a very broad word and we don't know what what the word means what exactly has happened but if there is severe abuse then it's difficult to forgive it's difficult to forgive from one side ourselves and uh, we can't just say that the lord's forgiveness uh, or because the lord is forgiving so we should also forgive no some that who knows that person might go and abuse if that person is abused in a severe way one person they might go and abuse other people also in fact uh, today we seem to be discussing a little bit unpalatable subjects but in the catholic church some of you may know that there have been a lot of child abuse scandals and not, not just child abuse was terrible what 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 enraged people was that the child abuse was covered up in a big way and now why was it covered up again there we could say that they were just uh, trying to protect their reputation and that's what uh, institutionalized religions do some people will use it as a that's how christians are bad but it's not that simple that was this is a ethical dilemma with christianity you know that christians especially catholics have that principle of conf- confession confession means if somebody has done something wrong then you go on a weekend or whenever you go to the father and you tell i did this wrong and the father says i'll forgive you and you have to do maybe chant some rosary or do something like that and you're given forgiveness and according to the according to the way it was traditionally that the that the whatever is spoken in the confessional booth the father has to keep it as a confession father should not tell anyone and then the, that that priest can give forgiveness for whatever wrongs you have done if you confess them so now what so the catholic church had a ethical dilemma that what is a sin that the church can forgive and what is a crime that the state has to pro- prosecute so there were these some of these priests who were abusing people and it came to be known and when it come to be known they would sometimes admit and they would seek forgiveness and they had some kind of hospitals where they would be mental, uh, like psychological counseling they were given and they were trying to be reinstated and then when they they seem to have a change of heart they were forgiven or sometimes because they were influential they just forgiven like that without even any any serious counseling or whatever but the point is that when when is something a sin to be forgiven by by a individual or a religious body and when is something a crime that has to be persecuted by the state so that is a crime and a sin are treated differently so we could say the categories can overlap at times so especially when it's abuse so it's not just a matter of forgiveness sometimes it's like a crime it has to be persecuted so it has to be prosecuted not persecuted so i don't know whether we have the power if we have the victims do we have the power to do that if we don't have the power to do that then what do we do then best is just to keep a distance from that person keep a distance from Uh, anyone who has closeness to that person and just find some safe space where we can practice we can grow in our life and we can make a life for ourselves so in that case forgiveness is very difficult and uh, another thing which can make it more difficult is sometimes we say forgive and forget so well that is said in a sense that don't keep replaying that image again and again and again and again 
So in that sense, I say forgive and forget. But forgetting is not so easy. There is no memory erase button in our brain that we can use for forgetting. So sometimes forgiving is not so much about forgetting as a fresh way of remembering. A fresh way of remembering means that when we when we uh, so if if say I've got a wound and it's a raw wound, then if say it's I've cut in my hand and even if my cloth touches the hand, it will cause me pain. That's a raw wound. But if um, that same wound is there, it's it's dried now. Then I can look at the wound. You can even touch it. But it doesn't cause that much pain. It may not cause much pain at all. Sometimes there's a lifelong scar that comes from some wounds. But if the scar has dried up, then there is no pain because of the scar. So similarly, what happens is uh, we may never be able to forget certain things. Uh, and sometimes some some lessons we have learned in a very through a lot of pain, and forgive forgetting them might forgetting those incidents which taught us those lessons might not be wise also. We have to become wiser from our experience. So for, we can say forgiving provides us a fresh way of remembering. That means it's like the wound is there. But if the wound is healed, healed, the scar is still there, but it doesn't cause me pain. So generally, uh, it may be very difficult for us to forgive that other person. But what we can do is maybe to somebody who understands us, somebody who is uh, mature, we can pour out our heart and unburden it and try to get rid of the resentment so that at least like the, the festering wound, the pass out of it comes out. And then the important thing is that we don't want that wound to keep festering within us. So for, forgiveness is not so much a gift that we give to the other person as a gift that we give to ourselves. So now we may decide, when we say, that's I have a whole... Seminar on forgiveness, if you go on my website, The Spiritual Scientist, I talk about forgiveness at three levels. There's intention, there is emotion, and there is action. So in terms of emotion means, I am feeling so much lighter. I, I was carrying this agenda. I want to get back at this person. It's all gone now. I feel lighter. And often we hear of forgiveness in those terms. And you know that that is wonderful if we can get that. But that doesn't happen so easily. So if we think of forgiveness only in terms of emotion, then it may take a long time to come. But we can look at forgiveness in terms of intention. Intention means that I won't keep dwelling on that again and again and again. Sometimes the memory comes up and the memory comes up, then we keep replaying it. Sometimes, But if the memory comes, okay, I'll, I'll think of something else. I won't dwell on it. So in terms of intention, all that it means is that... It is not my business to keep dwelling on this. So in terms of, I don't want to get even with that person. I don't want to get back at that person. Now, sometimes, so that's at the level of intention, we need to stop the replay of that memory. And one way to do that is by trying to create some fresh attractive memories, which we can direct our attention towards. But in terms of action, it depends. In terms of actions, we may forgive internally, but we may seek justice externally. And we can keep a sense of proportion. Sometimes we do certain things to seek justice. And then something moves forward. Sometimes it doesn't move forward. Then we have to decide how important is this for me? You know, because do I want to spend so much of my time and energy and seeking justice in this particular situation? Or you know, I want to go ahead with my life and, and let this be. So whichever path we take, it will have its consequences. So in terms of action, we might choose various things. We might just to put a distance and forget it. We might make it like a part of our life's mission to seek justice. Or we might actually be able to meet that person and uh, forgive them. That might be very difficult in some situations. So what we do in terms of action may vary from person to person. And what we talk at the level of emotion, that will take its own time to happen. But at least at the level of intention, I can decide. I won't, I'm not going to waste any more of my life in thinking of how terrible that person was and how I'm going to get back at that person. Yes, like I'm scarred physically and that's bad. But I am not going to further scratch that scar and rub my hand over it and make it worse. Physically, we won't do that. But mentally, 
if we keep replaying that abuse that hurt we are making that worse so we have to avoid that does it answer the question yes prabhu ji thank you very much and uh, uh, sundaranand prabhu is that you yes prabhu thank that's you. my question thank you for joining us and uh, ask your question yeah my question was prabhu that um, yeah that's up you know you said about uh, how you know sorry there is some uh, sorry if there is some background noise but uh, the kids are having a me one second so my question is uh, you know sensual activities uh, especially temptations of contracts or consciousness but sometimes you know um when we see things uh, which are not right that may also bother us and especially if those things are beyond our control then that also seems to uh, brooding on it seems to contract our consciousness can you elaborate a bit on that yes quite true and <clears throat> that we see some things that are wrong in the world and if we dwell on them what do we do with them is righteous principles have been trampled so there is uh, but we can't do much about it so do we will that lead to contracting of our consciousness well contraction is one way of phrasing it another is we could say choosing our battles and focusing our consciousness there is so much wrong in the world in so many different ways and if we just take in all that is wrong in the world that uh, that can simply agitate us and that doesn't lead to anything further so you know we could have something like uh, all of us different people have different causes which they get affected by some people might be very environmental conscious and they feel that so many people are doing so many wrong things even they may say devotees also not so green conscious of green of being eco friendly somebody might be very say nationalistic conscious or hindu conscious or dharma conscious and they say you know this is how dharma is misrepresented here this is what this is done over there this is what is done over there this is all that i spoke today from how now feminism now i have nothing against feminism per se i see feminism as a reaction to male chauvinism and uh, for some people they may just say that oh feminism is the biggest problem in the world for some people the same story or oh, this is all christians and leftists who are interpreting it like that and we need to so everybody can find uh some target for vengeance it's called scape not exactly scapegoating but something similar you know we all see something's wrong and we all ascribe those wrongs to certain people and then our emotional energy gets wildly direct ta- targeted toward that kind of those people whichever it might be so we have to be very careful that we don't waste our emotional energy so we have to what, what is it that i can do in this situation and how can i go about doing that so we choose our battles and we remind ourselves of why those battles are important mm. so some of my friends are in rss and uh, they are quite aggressive uh, of course rss is also demonized aggressive not in the sense that rss is sometimes treated like in the western media new york times and other places rss is treated like the hindu uh, taliban or hindu is or something like that but in the rss charter also they have that they don't use firearms at all they they, they have a specific char- clause that they will never use firearms so that's very different from what the islamic terrorist organizations are but still so it still he feels that it is okay you are chanting you are doing this bhakti but you are not doing anything practical to protect dharma so the way i see it is that yes you could say there is hinduism and islam or hinduism and christianity and there are threats no doubt but beyond those specific threats it's ultimately human human flaws it's human vices and virtues it is not christianity or islam or marxism or feminism or male chauvinism or whatever ism it might be that is the problem it is the lust anger greed envy pride and illusion in the hearts of people and of course those particular ideologies may shape them may aggravate them Uh, in particular ways but 
it is these are the problem and when we are practicing bhakti we are addressing those we may say i am addressing it only in my heart but what about their hearts well ultimately it has to be addressed at a, ultimately it has to be addressed in every human heart but the heart over which we have control is our own heart the most and we try to address it in the hearts of those who are receptive to bhakti so we have to choose our battles and we have to be convinced about the value of the battles that we are fighting so sometimes when we are preaching we often pre- maybe preach to elite class of people and then that is we may see they become devotees and we may see this in terms of okay okay a particular groups numbers are expanding but is this actually changing the world yes it is and and it should be changing the world and how it is doing is it's addressing the root problem now of course we could say that what is the use of our chanting hari krishna if somebody is coming and attacking and destroying our temples yes we need kshatriyas also now if i want to become a kshatriya fine if i have the nature if i have the resources if i have the position that's what i want to do i can become a kshatriya but if i am playing more or less the role of a brahmana and then i constantly am worrying about all the battles that a kshatriya should be fighting and uh, then i am simply wasting my emotional energy so so when we see righteous principles being trampled and we can't uh, we see that we can't do anything about it then should we be bothered about it well we don't want to be dehumanized and not think about it at all not not feel anything about it but we don't want to dwell on it wherever there is any wrong uh, we need to be aware of it i mean not that we have to go about and be aware of it if if it is if we come to know about it it we shouldn't be heartless and think it doesn't matter but we don't have to dwell on it so it's not so much in this case uh it's not so much contraction of consciousness as a as a focusing of the consciousness where we can do something does it address the question nandu yes prabhu yeah that addresses the question thank you thank you for that explanation thank you so uh, two more questions prabhu but i think you're uh, yeah i think let's take them good. let's take the questions quickly ஒரு <laughs> he is the king of gods because he has done a lot of punya previously so to one has to do a lot of yagyas and only some, some 100 yagyas or something like that one has to do to actually become indra so he has done a lot of punya but along with that punya when he gets that position there is a lot of temptation available and we also have to see that uh, it's in terms of the cosmic life span thousands and thousands of years indra if he does something wrong it is occasional so, in terms of all those years and but when see what happens is every book has its focus so uh, in the bhakti literature or in, when we are talking on the bhakti perspective sometimes the power of temptation is demonstrated uh, through extreme examples as i said with this and even great characters are shown to be victimized so for example if say he said there is a, there is some spin bowler maybe in cricket there is some some leg spin bowler or some spin bowler bowls a googly and he gets the batsman out now if there is going to be like a memory of how 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 dangerous the googly ball is then you are not going to show like street batsman getting out because of the googly ball you will probably show the top batsman in the world getting out now if somebody all that they watched about cricket was this how this googly ball bowled out that batsman then we may think this batsman does he ever do anything he always gets out only but there are other the other times when the batsman may have scored hundreds and thousands of runs but when the power of the googly is to be demonstrated they may demonstrate how oh, oh this batsman also gets out here 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 so many times so like that when the power of temptation is to be demonstrated you know okay some ordinary person gets tempted well it's like a street batsman getting out what's the great you know they they are nothing great 
But if a great batsman gets out, then the Google is a really dangerous ball. So like that, the power of temptation is demonstrated in scripture by showing how great characters, virtuous characters like Indra also get tempted. So we need to see it in the context of that the power of temptation is being illustrated and Indra lives for thousands and thousands of years. And in those thousands of years, occasionally he succumbs to temptation. So it's, so it's not, sometimes if we read only the epics, Indra seems to be like a, um, almost like a uncouth kind of, uncultured kind of character who always keeps doing wrong. That is a superficial, that is a misleading understanding. It's, he's a, he has virtue, he has done virtue, that's how he has come to a virtuous position. And he does do this, which are the responsibilities of that position also well. But there are times when he, he makes mistakes. Does it answer the question? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Krishna, uh, you can ask your question. Thank you, thank you, Jay Prabhu. Thank you, Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu, for the very nice class as always. Uh, so my uh, question, I thought, might be in, in the minds of uh, uh, many, is uh, if we were uh, to look at the descriptions of hell for different different sinful activities, it appears like just with one criteria such as meat eating more than 90% of the present day world would end up in hell. So first is, is that true? And if it is true, then how, what about the good activities the person does? Are they like separate? They enjoy, like, you know, uh, before or after they enjoy for the good activities, they suffer in hell. And if it is false, then how do we understand the uh, severity or the validity of the scriptural statement in itself? Hmm. Like how it should that be understood? Correct, yeah. So, Prabhu, to adding, adding to the question, his question, also we see some of the past life cases where people born in America, usually they end up eating meat, but then they immediately got a human body also. So, could yeah. comment on that as well. So, <clears throat> when you talk about scriptural statements, say if somebody goes to hell because, of, because they eat meat, then 90% of human society would end up in hell. And what about the other good activities that they may have done? Will they enjoy them separately? And if that is not true, then what is the object to nature of the statement? Well, okay. Scripture is more like a living tradition. And we need a, we could say, a, there is a synthetic understanding and there is a, a analytic understanding. What do I mean by synthetic and analytic? Or you could call it integrated and uh, isolated understanding. So just as say children, when they learn language, first language, not the second or third language. Second or third language, we might first, we might learn grammar. Okay, this is this, this is this. And then we learn the language gradually. But the first language, we just hear others speaking around us. We start speaking. And we, we have probably been using nouns, adjectives, verbs for for several years before we come to know that this is a noun adjective verb. Hmm? So the rules are there, but in real life, say when we construct a sentence, there might be different rules that come together and what might seem, hey, this is not a grammatically correct sentence. No, but this is grammatically correct because this rule applies over here. So in real life, when we, we are looking at real life, rules are applicable, but it's just by learning a rule book Somebody doesn't necessarily become expert in that language. One has to actually speak that language, live that, in a sense, live that language, mentally live that language, then they can become good at it. So, so the analytical understanding of languages is learn all the rules. The synthetic understanding of languages, that see the language as a, as a living tool for expression. And then the rules are assistance within that. So, so similarly, when we look at uh, scriptural statements, we may see this statement here, we may see that statement there, we may see that statement there. So the statements have utility, they have value. However, real life is complex and multiple points may come together. So if you consider the Bharat Maharaj pastime itself, at one level it is said that even if we take a prasad once, then we will not, we'll never get a, lose a human form. We will get a human form. Swalpa se dharma se trayate mahato bayat, as 2.14 the Bhagavata says. On the other hand, we say Bharat Maharaj was on a very advanced stage. 
from some perspectives he was at the level of bhav and still he became a deer so what happened so there are two rules over there one rule is if somebody is practice spiritual life then they will not lose the opportunity to continue practicing spiritual life and that opportunity is present in the human form so that means they will not lose the human form but the other thing is that if you remember a particular form at the time of death then that's what you will get at the time of death so now both these rules are there which will apply well both may apply in a nuanced way so because bharat maharaj remembered a deer at the time of death he got a deer's body and it was not just that he remembered the deer at the time of death he had also cultivated attachment to the deer throughout his life and then he remembered the deer at the time of death so he got a deer's body but he had also practiced spiritual life so because of that he got a deer's body biologically but his consciousness did not shrink to the level of a deer even a deer's body had human consciousness so both rules applied and uh, that's that's what i mean by synthetic uh, reality is to be seen synthetically not analytically alone in terms of which rules will apply so when we study the principles of karma there are statements okay this this will lead to this result that will lead to that result and these statements they are analytical statements but in real life things are complicated things are complicated so as you said that rightly speaking if we talk about a meat eater will go to hell what does that mean is it that somebody accidentally goes to somebody's house and they eat meat once because of peer pressure and somebody has been eating meat throughout their life all three meals a day are both of them going to get the same destination well it doesn't that doesn't make any sense at all so bhakti no thakur gives the guiding principle for the for the understanding the descriptions of hell he says that the basic principle when we look at the look at the descriptions of hell is that we are accountable for our actions that good actions will produce good results and bad actions will produce bad results karma first of all karma is not mathematically measurable so if we say for this action it will be this reaction so this action to what quantity and this action this reaction for how much time that's all very subtle so the so we cannot uh, uh my understanding of the of the statements in the bhagavatam or statements elsewhere about how which action leads to hell those are indicative they are not necessarily precisely uh, predictive that means that uh yes that if somebody eats meat there are there going to be consequences of that but what will be the consequences of that uh what exactly that will vary and as you rightly said what about the good thing that they have done they'll get the results of that also so we see that sometimes it works out linearly in the case of maharaj indruga uh he had to go to hell because of one indiscretion or he had to become a lizard because of one indiscretion and after that you said that he will get a heavenly body and enjoy in heaven sometimes things may come linearly sometimes things may come in different ways so broadly our if somebody has done bad karma then the reactions can come in three ways one is somebody goes to hell and suffers in hell second is somebody goes to a lower species and suffers in the lower species and third is somebody gets a human form but suffers in the human form now it may be that it could be if again karma is not mathematical but suppose somebody has a 100 units of karma then it may be that it may be say 30 30 40 or something like that and it may be different like that 30 in hell 30 in animal species 40 in human species or it could be 100 in hell and then when they come back they are almost like a clean slate in human form or it could be 100 in the human form itself and some of it might be in this times human form sometimes maybe in the next time human form so now just because somebody eats meat okay they eat meat but what what are they doing in the remaining part of their life that's also important that is also going to affect their consciousness so my understanding would be that these statements are indicative but they are like rules of grammar they are true but in real life multiple rules may apply and we'll have to see which rule applies where so that's why the parmatma is required so the the parmatma oversees upadrashta anumantach 
and there is a cosmic administration that the yamaraj is there so if it is simply this if this sentence will lead to that punishment then why is even yamaraj needed for he would have no no job at all but it's not that simple so reality will be complex and uh is everybody going to go to hell i don't know because uh, yes if you consider if there is a temp- temptation to reduce people to a particular behavior of theirs or these people are meat eaters okay but are all meat eaters all all meat eaters the same and the meat eaters the rest of their life may be different in different cases so are they accountable only for this action not for the other actions no they we are accountable for every action so really that's why you know if we i'll conclude with this point that if we take these statements as literally true in every situation then why does krishna have to say in the bhagavad gita gahana karmano gati the movements of karma are very difficult to discern so gahana karmano gati means that in real life which action will lead to what consequence when that is all very very difficult to understand so rather than insisting on the literality of certain statements or rejecting the literality of certain statements we can recognize the principle underlying principle of accountability and the complexity of reality means how that accountability will be playing out we don't know so we don't judge and tell people you are going to go to hell uh, but we recognize that we all need to learn to become more accountable does it answer your question yes yes thank you bro that was uh, very holistic and i think you bo- very beautifully brought out the spirit of what the literature wants to convey to us and also like you mentioned uh, we should look at the diversity because it's not just that meditating is the only aspect of their life and uh, and also the magnitude of their actions so if it is like once versus you know like throughout the life then they should uh, analytically have both their different consequences for that so very beautifully brought out thank you bro so thank you very much for your attention and thoughtful participation hare krishna thank you, Opa, thank you very much jai ram chandra bhagwan ki jai thank you prabhu thank you thank you hare krishna